Before I introduce myself, uh, I want to go through a little bit of housekeeping. Um, number one, the agenda for today is pretty, pretty straightforward. I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes or so uh, presenting, talking, uh, and then we'll spend the rest of that time about 20 minutes or so for, for Q&A. We're going to do about 20 minutes of presentation, 20 minutes for question and answer. Uh, please, please, please use the chat. Uh, ask your questions there at the end during the Q&A. My colleague, uh, Jeremy, is going to moderate the Q&A portion by, by looking at questions from the chat. So please type in your questions either during the presentation itself or, uh, or during the Q&A part, and he'll feed those questions to me, and I'll, I'll answer as many as I can. Uh, yes, we are indeed recording this, so uh, for those of you that have to jump off or would like to share it with colleagues afterward, we will try and get this out to you before the weekend. There's a chance uh, that it will be early next week, uh, but, uh, but yes, this is absolutely being recorded. In fact, let me just quadruple check that I hit the record button. I did, so we are, we are all set there. Um, okay, so now I can introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rainey. I am the content director for Cosmatch. And the very first thing that I want to do is give you my email address, which is rainy at cosmatch.com. I'm going to give this to you again at the end of the presentation. But it's very important for me that you have, have this uh, my email address right here, front and center, because uh, I don't like that this conversation is so one directional. Uh, I want to hear your questions, your comments, your feedback, both on this presentation itself uh, and, and just in general on topics uh, related to fundraising content. So please, 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 both literally and figuratively, my inbox is always open. I'm really always happy to hear from you. I'm eager to hear from you. Uh, so Rami at Cosmatch.com. I want to take 30 seconds, maybe a minute, to talk a little bit about Cosmatch. And not because I'm here to sell you on Cosmatch. I'm not on the sales team. I don't work on commission. There's no bonus for me if you sign up for our services after this webinar. I want to talk to you about Cosmatch and why we're doing this webinar today. Cosmatch is the most powerful fundraising platform on the market. And what makes it so powerful is the combination of the technology, the strategy, and the support. Because offering one of those things, in my mind, offering the technology, let's say, without the strategy as to how to use it, simply doesn't make sense, especially, especially when we're going through unchartered fundraising times like we're going through right now. When there is a crisis happening, when there's chaos around us, when we have large existential fundraising questions to answer, it doesn't make sense to just give you the technology and say, here it is, go and fund these. The reason that we're conducting this webinar today is because we at Cosmatch, I can speak for my colleagues when I say that we at Cosmatch feel like we are in this together with you. You, the frontline fundraisers, we're grappling with the same questions that you are. We're forming the best fundraising strategy that we know just like you are. We are in this together with you. So once again, I wanna use this as an opportunity for you to reach out to us, to talk fundraising strategy, to look at the fundraising opportunities ahead of you. We have an amazing team of fundraising coaches and guides on our staff that are eager, eager to help any way that, that they can, that we can. So I just wanna sort of put that out there. This is who Cosmatch is, this is what we do, and this is why we're doing this webinar today because we are all in this together from a fundraising standpoint. Before I begin in earnest, I was wondering if you can all open up your chats and put in the name of your organization that you represent. Um, if it's not obvious from the name of your organization, I would love to see what impact area you serve. Uh, in that way, that'll help me uh, sort of tailor, tailor my responses or tailor my, uh, my examples as I go through this presentation. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just opening up that chat and letting me see your what organizations you all represent. Amazing. It's nice to see so many, both so many familiar uh, faces and names of people of organizations and also so many new ones to me. Um, it's really nice to meet you all for those that I haven't met and nice of you to be here today. Thank you again for coming. Amazing. Okay. I want to begin this conversation today uh, by laying out what my questions were as I, I approach this presentation. Uh, in thinking about this, I'm making two assumptions about the people that are on this webinar today, about, about you all. Number one is I'm assuming that you all represent either Jewish organizations or organizations that fundraise largely from Jewish donors or a segment of Jewish donors. And I'm also assuming for the purposes of this conversation 
that the next fund fundraising campaign that you have in mind is not for an Israel related cause. It's either for general operating support or for programmatic support that's not Israel related. And in thinking about what our questions are, how do we go about fundraising over the next, let's say six weeks between now and the end of the year? I thought about two questions. Number one was how do we not appear tone deaf? Right? Because there are so many life and death issues happening all around us. There's so many life and death, serious existential issues happening all around us. And here we're gonna go and we're gonna fundraise for our local organization or our national organization for something that may not be life and death. And at the same time, just make the question all the more pressing, this issue of what's happening in Israel, the anti-Semitism on college campuses around the world, uh, this issue is personal and emotional for so many people. Everyone knows someone who is a soldier on the front lines or is on a college campus right now dealing with un really unprecedented anti-Semitism on campuses. So the issue is, is really personal and that can make our, our message, that can make it feel tone deaf. So how do we not appear tone deaf? That's the first question that I wanna set out to answer today. The second question is, what if donors are tapped out from giving to Israel related causes? But we've seen such a tremendous amount of generosity in philanthropy over the last six weeks. Millions and millions of dollars have gone from your donors to Israel-related causes. And I might add that these dollars were not dollars that your donors expected to give at the beginning of October. Right? So how do, we, how do we account for the fact that your donors very well may be tapped out from giving to Israel-related causes? And thinking about that question, the very first thing that I want to do is validate those questions and concerns. I think they're the right questions to be asking. And I think that there's a chance that your fundraising may be down this year, especially for that second reason, because your donors have given to so many other Israel-related causes. I wanna put that out there and say, that's okay. These questions are okay. They're the right questions to be asking. At the same time, the way that I think about it, there are gonna be three types of organizations over the next six weeks, say the next two months. There's going to be those organizations that choose not to fundraise. And I guarantee you those organizations are not going to raise a whole lot of money. There's going to be organizations that choose to fundraise, but don't do this in a sensitive way. And in a lot of ways, I think that this category is almost in a worse position than the first because there's a chance that they could damage their relationships with donors. There's a chance that they could damage their relationships with donors for the long term. The third type of organization that we're going, that I think we're going to see, are organizations that choose to fundraise, but focus on strengthening their relationship with donors for the long term. Naturally, that's where I want these organizations. I, that's where I want you to get to. That's where I believe that we can be, and I believe that if we fall into that third category, we're going to raise a lot of money for our organizations. We're going to be able to be successful in our fundraising campaigns if we do this with sensitivity and focusing on the long term relationships with our donors. And looking for inspiration for how we're going to answer this question, how can we go into these questions about being tone deaf? Uh, the, the first place that I, my mind went to was COVID. And I think this is very similar to COVID in a very specific regard, right? Because in our Jewish world, this is happening to everyone. It's sort of a communal experience. Everyone is dealing with it in certain ways, and there's certainly their level of closeness to the situation may be different. But just like COVID, Everyone is dealing with this. It's a, it's a communal experience. And just like in COVID, when we saw a tremendous amount of philanthropy, I believe that the reason that we saw so much generosity is because you, fundraisers, did such a good job of being human, of making it a relationship between your donors, of asking donors, how are you doing? How are you dealing with this? How are you grappling with, with the crisis unfolding? And I think that we can learn from that for this experience as well that we can use this as an opportunity to ask our donors how they're doing. Do they know someone in Israel? Do they know someone on a college campus? And I think that we can do this, this relationship fundraising. We can do it both on a one-to-one -one meeting with a, with a major donor, and we can do it in a mass mailing to a huge group of people. We can do this at every step of communication when we put out our fundraising message and when we think about our fundraising strategy. We can focus on the relationship that we have as fundraisers with our donors. So the very first takeaway that I want to, to leave you with today is that this is still very much about relationship fundraising. The core tenant that's true about fundraising always still applies now. If we honor and respect our donors, if we use this, if we use the act of fundraising to deepen our relationships with donors, we're going to see success.
So that's that's key takeaway number one, that this is still very much about relationship fundraising. However, in thinking about this even a, a little bit more further and how it's similar or dissimilar to COVID, I found it, it really, there's a major difference between what's happening now and COVID. And that is one of the other reasons why I believe you were all so successful in fundraising during COVID was because you were raising money for COVID-related expenses, right? You needed more equipment, you needed plastic dividers, you needed more space so you could run your programs in a socially distanced way. And you were able to turn to donors and point to the need and say, this is why we need the money. And donors responded. You were able to raise money for, the crisis, for crisis related resources. And that's not something that we have in our toolbox for, for this experience, right? Because I'm assuming that you are not raising money for Israel related causes. You're raising money for your, your local Jewish organization, institution, a, a school, a shul, a Kirov center. You're raising money for something that is not Israel related. So you can't turn to donors and say, look at all the, look at this global crisis, look at this Jewish crisis, please give us money for this cause. So I needed to find a different place to answer these questions. I needed to find a different source of inspiration. And I found it uh, in a place that is, is unsurprising to me, but when I've spoken to people, many people find it surprising. I, I love political fundraising. I love political fundraising. I sign up for every candidate's emails. I love election season. I sign up for all of their emails because I think they are absolute amazing fundraisers. And I think there's a ton, a ton to learn from them. They raise money. They raise millions and millions of dollars from huge swaths of people, huge swaths. And they have to because there's actually a cap on how much you can give a political party. So. They're raising all of these millions and millions and millions of dollars from, from huge, huge, huge groups of people. But that's not, that's not what impresses me about it. The thing that impresses me about it is that they're working at a significant disadvantage. And the disadvantage that they're working with and successful despite is that they never tell you what they're going to do with your money, ever, ever. Again, I've signed up for pretty much every candidate's email list. I look at all of their ads. They never tell you how your $10, $100, $1,000 is going to be used, what it will actually fund. The reason that they don't do that is because you know what it's going to fund? It's going to fund ad buys, and it's going to fund uh, office space, and it's going to fund overhead and staffing. It's going to fund things that donors do not want to donate to. So they never tell you how your money is actually going to be used. And yet, they are unbelievably successful. And I love, and this is a core, this is like a core principle of fundraising. You always tell donors how their money is going to be used. That's the first question that donors ask. How is my money going to be used? So how are they, how are politicians able to be so successful in their fundraising without ever telling me how my, my money is going to be used? And I found three answers that I think are extremely applicable to the situation that we're in today. And I want to go through those three, those three answers of how politicians do this and how we as Jewish organizations or organizations that are raising money from Jewish donors might be able to apply them to our fundraising strategy moving forward. The first thing that I noticed as I was going through my notes and looking through my emails of political fundraising is that politicians raise money on identity. They, it's true, they don't tell you how your money is going to be used. Instead, they tell you who you become when you donate. They tell you who you become when you donate. I picked out a couple of examples, and this was like the easiest exercise in the world for me because every single email, no matter the candidate, did this. So let me just give you three examples of how they tell you how who you're going to become when you donate to their campaign. So this one. I have to move my windows here. The future of America depends on the actions of patriots like you. When you donate, you become a patriot. Right? another example. Be a champion for conservative principles. This is who you become when you donate to a campaign. You become a champion for conservative principles. Or in this case, whatever you give is an investment in victory in these key early states, but it's also an investment in the fresh start America needs. It's an act of hope for a whole era. Who wouldn't want to be an investor in the fresh start America needs? They are playing on my identity. They are telling me who I become when I donate to a campaign. And once again, the reason why I think that this is so important and so relevant for us as organizations raising money for Jewish causes right now is because what's happening is an attack on Jewish identity. We can very safely say 
I'm assuming that this is authentic for your organizations. I believe that it is looking through all of the organizations that are participating in this. That when you donate, you are saving someone's Jewish identity. You are strengthening someone's Jewish identity. Of course, you, are, you will find the right ways to say this for your specific organization. But we can play on that identity fundraising and tell donors that they are joining the fight in this regard for, for identity. So let me let me give you a couple of examples. I, I jotted some things down of how this might look like for Jewish organizations. Uh, I wrote, now more than ever before, Jewish young adults are searching for a sense of identity. Their love of Judaism depends on you. Or be a champion for the next generation of proud Jews ready to stand up for what they believe in. Or whatever you donate is an investment in the future of the Jewish people. It is an investment in each and every young mind who walks through our door. These are statements of identity that, again, I believe you can use in your strategy as you're thinking about how you're going to structure your campaign, both in mass communications and when you're talking to one-on-one -on -one to major donors. This can be applied throughout. That was the first piece or the second piece, the second key takeaway that I would like to stress, the first coming from politicians. So the first one we talked about was that this is still about relationship fundraising. And the second one is that supporting Jewish causes right now is an act of identity for people and to use that to play on that as much as you can. The next thing that I noticed about political fundraising is that they are excellent at naming the stakes. They are excellent at telling you what will happen if, if we don't win, if we don't win. And once again, because we're in the situation where the stakes are so incredibly genuine, the stakes, the stakes being high are genuine, authentic, and real. I think there's such an application for this in the work that, that you all are doing. So let's look at some examples from politicians, and then we'll look at some examples that I put together for Jewish organizations. So number one, that's why Mitch McConnell and the National GOP are targeting Pennsylvania for millions in dark money spending. They're hoping that their super PAC will be able to flip the Senate red. Like the stakes are so incredibly clear and simple when they put it like this, so incredibly simple. Another example, defeating Joe Biden in 2024 is gonna take the strongest possible candidate. We need your help to make that happen. They're putting it out there in really clear, simple terms. These are the stakes. I'll give you one more example. I couldn't be more concerned about the radical Biden agenda. The administration's failed policies have created countless crises and they must be held accountable in 2024. These statements are, again, are so strong and they point directly to what is at stake, the problem, the enemy in a lot of ways. They say, this is what the enemy, who the enemy is, this is what is at stake. So in thinking about Jewish organizations, uh, I've worked on several cause match campaigns over the last couple of weeks and I was able to take these st statements directly, directly from those campaigns. Anti-Semitic activists are well-funded and they are merciless in their attempts to intimidate and demean Israel and Judaism. Instilling a love of Judaism is going to take a lot of community effort. It's going to take a lot of resources. Or we are more concerned than ever before about the future of Judaism in our community. We can name the stakes. We can name the stakes. So that is principle, principle number three. To make your message about combating an enemy, whether it's anti-Semitism, preparedness on campus, a lack of Jewish pride, a lack of Israel pride, you'll find the right ways to word this for your organization so that it makes sense. But because we're in the situation of crisis right now, it's not disingenuous to do this. It's, it's, it's perfectly authentic to point to an enemy and say, this is what we are doing. This is how we're combating it. This is actually a tool pointing to an enemy is something that marketers outside of the, the philanthropy space uh, really love to do. They love to make an enemy, to point to an enemy and say that our product or service is the hero that overcomes this enemy. And that sort of leads to the next principle that politicians do really well. It's another marketing tool that you see a lot once you start to pay attention to it. And that is marketers love to give consumers choices or to say it differently, consumers love to have choices. We don't want to be told what to do. We want to say, to be told we can do this or we can do that. This one was a little surprising to me as I came across it from politicians but it's, it's very, very smart. It's, it's brilliant in a lot of ways that they do this. They give donors permission not to give. They give donors permission not to give. I wanna show you the examples of how they do this, and then I'm gonna try and explain why I think it's so important. So some of the examples that I saw, this is super subtle. It's really subtle, but they, it has a tremendous effect. 
We know it's a difficult time to contribute, but we truly believe that grassroots donors like you will decide the outcome of this election. That phrase, we know it's a difficult time to contribute, does so much. So from the marketing standpoint, yes, it gives consumers, the donor in this case, a choice. I can or I can't. But I think it does something much more powerful than that. I think it establishes that level of, of humanness, of relationship between the organization, the political party, and the donor. It says to them, we know that this is a difficult time. We see you. We hear you. We know what's happening on the ground. And especially now to take it back into our world, where we know this is such a difficult time for people financially, emotionally, mentally, logistically. This is such a difficult time to be able to use this type of strategy in your messaging to say, we know that it's difficult, but our work is still important, can have a tremendous, tremendous effect. I want to give you one other example. Saw, so if a donation makes sense, I love this language. If a donation makes sense for you, please chip in whatever you can. This language establishes that relationship. It secures that relationship and says that I care about you. I also care about my organization and fundraising is super important to us to, to thrive, but I care about you and the relationship. Because the worst thing from a fundraising standpoint, the worst thing that can happen is not that a donor doesn't give to your organization. There are indeed going to be donors, maybe even major donors, who decide not to give or not to give as much to your organization this year because of everything that's happening. And in this, to a certain extent, that's okay. That is to be expected. The quote unquote worst thing that can happen from a fundraising standpoint is that we lose that relationship, is that we damage that relationship. And that when we go back to that person in three months, in nine months, in a year from now, that person is lost because we didn't establish that relationship and say, I see you. I know that you're here. I know that you're going through something difficult. And I'd like to see if you can support our cause and be a, be a powerful advocate for what we're trying to do here. So like I've been doing, I want to try and flip these sentences for Jewish organizations, see how they might look. So they might look like this. I know you've likely donated more money in October than you expected to, but we cannot give students all the resources they need to soar without your help. Or if a donation makes sense for you right now, please donate. Build a Jewish community where people feel safe, inspired, and uplifted. Again, you can use these types of statements. You can use the strategy in one-on-one -on -one sessions, uh, in mass mailings. You can use this as a structure for your campaigns so that at least the foundation upon which you're building is 100% relationship-based. And that strengthens your relationships with donors. I want to throw out one more radical idea you know, in this regard of giving donors permission not to give. Um, this is not something that I would ever otherwise have the guts to present to you unless I had data to support it. Okay? I would never suggest that you do this unless there was the math behind it. But I found the math behind it, so I'm going to suggest it to you. There's an amazing company out there that I love called Next After. Next After. Next After is a research group that uses nonprofits all over the world to test messages, to see what donors respond to, to understand what inspires people to give. And I found a study that they did a bit ago that is shocking on, on really so many levels. And I think it really underscores the point that, that I'm, I'm trying to make here. I wanna show you two pieces of copy. They sent this message to 50%, they sent one, the top message here to 50% of their database and they sent 50% uh, to the, uh, the, the bottom paragraph. So I just want to read the bottom paragraph for you right now. The top one is, is the control group. The bottom one is, is the test. So the bottom one says, you have generously given, let's say, $100 in the past. With all of the uncertainty in the world, we're not asking for the same level of support. Instead, your gift of $50 today, when combined with other supporters, will provide the resources we need right now. So they asked donors for a decrease. And the results of this study were really very surprising. I'm sure you might be able to predict what they are at this point. But the top one, the control group that asked for the same amount as last year, possibly an increase, was $54. That was the average gift. $54 gave to that top paragraph. The bottom paragraph got nearly double. Nearly double the amount of average gift size from that second, the second way of asking for the less amount. And I think the logic is pretty clear because by saying, by asking for less, we're telling donors we see them, we get it, we understand that you're going through something. So 
I don't, I don't know that I'm able to say, go and use this bottom language in your fundraising. I don't know that I, I quite have uh, the, 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 the confidence in this to go and do this, but I, I would suggest that you try it. Try it with, with a donor, with a major donor, let's say, who you know has given a lot to uh, Friends of the IDF or uh, Magen David Adom or some Israel-related cause. Say, you know what, I know that you've given so much to these Israel-related causes. Let's come down a little bit from what you did last year. Or another way to implement this might be if you're going to run a campaign between now and the end of the year. So let's say it's going to be you know a 72-hour campaign or 36-hour campaign. So you're going to send your, your database, you're going to send your donors five, six, seven emails over the course of that campaign. Let's say an email number three or four that you send them. Once they, they've already passed three times on the first two or three emails that you've sent them, try including this language. See if it works. Uh, I'm legitimately curious. I would love to hear if you do go and do this, what the results are. But I think there's something so powerful in this study. And you can see the study for yourself. It's easy to find on nextafter.com. And there's total legitimacy to this. These are researchers, statisticians who make sure that the, the sample is valid. This is a real study. But I think that the, the point that it underscores is establishing that relationship with donors can have a tremendous, tremendous effect. And that is really the point that I wanted to leave you here with today. So before I wrap up, I want to sort of spot check myself to make sure that that's what I did what I set out to do here today. So the, the two questions that I laid out in the beginning of this presentation were, how do we not appear tone deaf and our donors tapped out? How do we how do we account for the fact that donors might be tapped out from giving to Israel-related causes? I think in these four takeaways, we're able to answer these two questions. Right? We're going to establish that relationship fundraising. We're going to not be tone deaf because we're going to be real and authentic and make sure that we're asking how our donors are doing and make this a common experience that's happening to Jews all over the world. Right? We're going to make sure we're not tone deaf by telling people that when you give, you are exercising your Jewish identity. You are, it is expression of who you are as a person when you donate to our cause. And we're going to point to an enemy and say, this is how high the stakes are. This is not disingenuous. This is not just another ask. This is people's Jewish pride, our students' Jewish identity on the line here. And we're gonna account for the fact that people might have given a whole lot of money to other causes by naming it, by saying it out loud, by saying, I know that you've given a lot to all of these amazing organizations that are doing life-saving work. And at the same time, the work that we're doing on the ground here is really important and there are lives at stake and Jewish identity at stake with what we're doing as well. So those are the four key takeaways that I want to leave you here with. With that, don't know, I haven't looked at my watch. I think I am did good on time. I'm not 100% sure, but at very least I can put out my contact information again. Uh, it is rami at cosmatch.com, but we can spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so with question and answer if anyone does have questions. I'm going to ask you to type them into the chat and ask Jeremy if you can uh, come off mute and help moderate any questions that come in. You got it. Questions. Quiet group. Give everyone another uh, few seconds to uh, submit their questions. Um, okay, uh, Remy, the first question is, uh, how, how would this be any different, if at all, if the donor base is not Jewish or Israeli? Is not at all Jewish or Israeli? Is not all Jewish. Is not all Jewish or Israeli. So uh, the best the best way to do this is, uh, I see this is from, I'm looking at the chat as well, it's from Lindsay. If I'm not mistaken, my memory serves correctly, Lindsay is, works for an Israel-based organization. So the fact that it is, it, it, if I'm correct about that, uh, if it is a, a, an Israel-related organization, then I would like to think that your donors are still all united around the mission that supports Israel. So I think that it, it's still, there's still a tie-in that you can make to what's happening. And it, it's not far, it's not a loose tie, it's a pretty direct tie that what is happening right now is affecting uh, is affecting your, your constituents. Um, and I think even to say, uh, for a lot of the organizations that are on here, I know there's a lot of more health and human service organizations that have joined us today that are not necessarily dealing with Jewish education. Uh, I think to be able to point to what's happening and saying, 
there are people out there that are, are, are celebrating death. And we are an organization that celebrates life. And when you donate to our organization, you become a champion for life. I think those are types of statements that might be outside of the, the, the Jewish realm. We're not talking about Jewish identity in that space, but we're talking about life. And all of this, again, assumes, Lindsay, that uh, your, your donor base does care about what's happening in Israel, even if they, in particular, are not Jewish. Um, thank you, Remy. The uh, next question is, can you talk, uh, speak to a bit about donor fatigue, concern about donor fatigue in general, especially because people have given to all these emergency campaigns? Yeah. Uh, it's donor fatigue, on the one hand, is real. People are tired of giving. Um, they've given a lot. Again, we've seen a tremendous amount of philanthropy. However, however, when fundraising is done right, in my opinion, people are ecstatic to give. They feel awesome about giving. And I think the challenge that we have as fundraisers is to structure our strategy, to structure our message, to make the ask in a way that makes donors feel awesome about giving, that they get that huge dopamine hit. It says, I just saved someone's life. I just changed someone's life by donating to this cause. And it's a little bit of a mindset shift, but I, I think that if we approach it from that perspective as fundraisers, then we're going to be able to combat donor fatigue because this isn't a, another organization I have to give to, but it's an opportunity that I get as a donor to go and change someone's life. It's really the approach that I like to think of it at from, that to make donors just feel absolutely awesome about giving to our organizations. Awesome. Uh, and going through the questions, I'm I'm looking for those that are more general as opposed to specific to particular organizations. Uh, so the next question um, from Zev is, can you share your ideas of how to phrase something like, I know it is difficult to give right now. Um, the concern being, if you ask something like, when would be a good time to call you, the donor might just use it as an opportunity to push you, uh, to push you off over and over again. Uh, so if you have any other suggestions about language about, around that. Sure. Um, getting the meeting is very hard. Getting getting the meeting can be a very difficult thing to do. Uh, I, I think it takes a little bit of, uh, I think that's one of the reasons why so many organizations use the end of the year as a time to run fundraising campaigns because it gives those donors that extra motivation to try and donate before the end of the year where they get that tax write-off. So I think, first of all, we can look to sort of external things that are happening with the end of the year and say, let's let's get this on the books before, before the calendar turns to 2024. I think that's number one. And I think to try in the very short amount of time that you have to get on someone's calendar to press upon this person the, the, the importance and the sense of urgency of doing this now. Um, we, we have to workshop that. We have to figure out together uh, how, how to structure that. Oh no, I want to say hi to everyone. Um, but uh, but I think that you could set and say set that sense of urgency and say this is really important, not just in general, but for us to do it now. Uh, but Zev, I'd be happy to workshop some other ideas with you. We can if you email me afterward. I, I I know that I have other material that we would be able to to workshop there. Cool. Uh, here's a question that was sent directly to me. Um, if you could speak a bit more about your first point, which is honoring honoring your donors and and elaborate a bit more on not sounding tone deaf sure um so i, I want to hear a little bit more about the question but i can i can say that fundraising is all about relationships it's all about relationships so when we make it transactional when we ask people for money and it's purely transactional it's it's sort of easy to say no Right, the mantra at Cause Match is people give to people, which we use uh, certainly from a peer-to-peer -peer aspect, but even from a fundraiser to, to a donor aspect. So honoring and respecting your donors is about seeing them. It's about acknowledging. Again, it's about starting off with a question to them, the question of how are you doing? Do you know someone who's on the front lines in Israel? Do you know someone who's going through a difficult time on a college campus? It's about establishing that relationship with them and then the fundraising will come, the fundraising will come. But from my perspective, when we think about fundraising, the very foundation upon which it needs to be built is that, is that relationship, is forming that relationship. 
uh, again, I, 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 I truly believe that we should always be looking, if we're going to look at donors from, from a financial standpoint, it's not about this campaign. It's not. It's about the lifetime value of a donor, that if you really create a strong relationship, a strong connection with a donor, they won't just give this campaign, but they'll give again and again and again. And we can't establish that connection with them unless we form that relationship and, and really just, just see them. Um, and this what, what's happening in the world right now, the crisis that's happening, that asset that it affords us is to ask them how they're doing to say, well, what's happening in your world? How are you dealing with this? Um, and that that will just open up a relationship. It will open up a conversation and allow you to build upon it from, from a fundraising standpoint. Okay, we have uh, two questions about uh, goal setting. And again, I'm looking for questions that are going to be uh, more, more applicable to, uh, to everyone, uh, and then we can get into one specifically for particular organizations. Uh, so, th so the questions around goal setting, and I'll give an, an example of what this might be, might, might look like. Let's say an organization does a typical end of year campaign uh, where they raise a quarter of a million dollars, and they just ran an emergency campaign to help soldiers or some sort of emergency need, and they raised $100,000. So how should they set their goal for their end of year campaign? They ran the emergency campaign in October. Two months later, they have their end of year. Should they just discount $100,000 from their end of the uh, end of year goal? Or they should uh, anticipate, hope and expect and ask their donors to give uh, as they gave before? Excellent question. So uh, the first thing that I would like to say uh, is that there are people on the Cosmatch team that this is like truly their level, their their area of expertise, goal setting. And I think that there's a lot to uncover here. I am not one of those people, but but I am able to, to tell you a couple of things. One is that uh, donors will give again in a quick amount of time. They will. So I don't want you to discount that and think that just because they gave two months ago, they won't give to us again. Uh, donors will give again especially if we make them feel awesome about their gift, especially if that's really our focus and we will make them feel awesome and they will they will give again. I think it's a, it's a combination, goal setting in my mind is a combination of what the needs are, which I see as one of the, the variables, but it's also, a, it's a little bit of a math question. It's a little bit of mapping out where you think the money can come from and doing your best to, to estimate which channels are going to bring in how much money. Uh, so it, it takes a little, you know, opening up that that Excel doc or that Excel sheets or Google Sheets or whatever you're using to map out, say, okay, from our major donors, we can raise this amount of money. Uh, let's be conservative about it. From if we're going to do a peer-to-peer -peer effort, we think that we can get this number of ambassadors who are going to each raise X number of dollars uh, on average. I think it's a little bit of just mapping where the money comes from and approaching it both from what the needs are and what we think the sources of fundraising may be. Awesome. Um, okay, the next question is, uh, and I think it might just be highlighting some of the points that, that you've made, um, which is, uh, and just really to clarify, if an organization does activities that are not Jewish or war related, um, is will it be con will it be counterproductive for them to fundraise now? Meaning, are Jewish donors only giving to uh, Jewish or war related causes, or yeah, they can still fundraise. They can still fundraise now. Organizations can absolutely fundraise now. Organizations can absolutely fundraise now. I think they have to do it with sensitivity. They have to do it knowing that there are all of these factors going on. Uh, but I guarantee you that if you don't fundraise, you won't raise any money. You're making the decision not to give on behalf of your donors. And that's something that 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 not only is 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 painful from a financial point of view, but but again, I think that you're giving donors an opportunity to support a cause that they love when you ask them to fundraise. When you when you fundraise from them, you're asking them to 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 become a champion for whatever your mission is, to invest in what it was at the fresh start that America needs. You're asking them to to invest in something amazing. And by giving them the opportunity to do that, I, I see a question came in from the chat. How do you make donors feel great about giving? I think you make the story of your fundraising campaign, you make it all about the donor. You continue to tell donors how awesome they are when they donate over and over and over again. And when you when, when that's the main message, that you are a hero by giving to, to our campaign, by giving through us to our, to our service recipients, uh, 
sure, I don't know what organization you're from, but you know, if it's a school that you are the person who is educating the next generation of Jewish young adults so that they're prepared to go on the college campus, that's how you make donors feel great. That's how you make donors feel great. And that's how you're able to sort of uh, overcome the other challenges, the other fundraising challenges that we have here uh, by really just focusing on that message. Awesome. Um, all right, the next question is, how should the head of, head of an organization organization message this ahead of the fundraising ask? And so I'll elaborate that on, on that a little bit. Uh, an executive director is gonna meet with a major donor to ask for a, a large annual gift. Um, what messaging should there be relayed either directly or more broadly uh, speaking in, 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 in advance of, of making that, uh, that ask at this time? Um, it's an interesting question. I, I think there are some general rules that could apply, but naturally in these types of major asks, you wanna know who you're talking to. You wanna know who the major donor is and what types of things they care about and what sort of questions, if you're able to anticipate what questions this person is going to have. Um, but generally, even major donors, I think there's a misconception that major donors are, are, are you know, really just giving from a cerebral point of view, thinking about the numbers and breaking down the numbers. But all of the research suggests that it's still an emotional decision. You still want to appeal to people's sense of identity. You still want to make it very uh, human and emotional and, and describe how people's lives are going to be changed because of a donor's gift. So in my mind, before you do a major ask, to sort of have those stories mapped out. Um, you can have one of the, the sort of uh, tricks that I've, I've adopted over the years was, I know so many of you uh, are great at collecting success stories of your organizations and your service recipients, whether it's an alum, alum from your organization or, or someone who was able to just came from, you know, not a strong background and ended up doing amazing things. And for you to be able to take that sort of success story and say to a ma major donor, say there are so many other people out there who are just like the success story at the beginning of the story, who need your support to be able to, to, to succeed, to thrive, to flourish. Um, once again, I, I think it'll be a, be a little bit easier for me to answer if there were more specifics and I would welcome this person to, to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk more about this, but to just be able to point to those very specific case studies and stories and say, this is what we can do, but there are so many more people that need our help and your donation is gonna make sure that we're able to deliver it. Generally, the, the strategy that I'm for. Thank you. We'll take one one last question if anyone wants to submit. Okay, Jason asks, just resetting our dilemma, we are considering a, a separate security fund appeal for our campus, but my inclination is to simply fundraise for security costs under the annual campaign rather than a separate restricted fund. I'm concerned about cannibalizing our annual fund at both the school and temple. What are your thoughts on this? So um, I'm just trying to process all that. So they have their annual fund. They also want to, uh, they, they have security needs that they need to fundraise for. Um, how do you address the concern of, of taking away from the annual fund fundraising if they're also raising for security needs? Should it just be incorporated within the annual fund uh, campaign? Okay, another excellent question. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I will, I will, I'm going to address this with just with one point because I see we're, we're right at the, the quarter after here and I don't want to want to respect everyone's time. But what I would say that the biggest danger that I, I like to avoid when structuring these types of appeals is confusion. And I just want you to be aware that they're, they're, if you do operate two separate funds, that can cause confusion. And that's where I think we really lose a lot of donors is complexity, confusion, not making things simple and clear. So my instinct, just based on this very short summary of, of what you're doing, is to put it under one, one, one fund and make sure people know that part of what that fund is going to do is going to secure your, your facility, because I guarantee that that's a major issue for your donors. I and mean, that security is like the main thing that people like to give to right now, given, given all of the threats that are out there. Um, so I just say, if you're going to embark on two separate 
funds, some two separate appeals, one for general operating and one for something specific like security. Just make sure that there's no confusion between the two and you don't have donors saying, oh, why am I, would I give to the second one I already gave to one? Um, just make sure that there is a lot of clarity behind what you're doing. And if that proves to be difficult to group them together, I think might be a better strategy uh, just so that there's not that confusion and people understand exactly what they are going to fund. Um, but once again, I'm keeping my screen share open on purpose because it does have my email address. And uh, I would really love to hear from you and just continue these conversations. So with that, uh, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thank you again. <laughs>